opportunities if you're a young adult, 18, uh, oh, 18 and older, out of high school, you're welcome to hang out, which meets on the porch at our place every second week, and today is the week. So, yeah, it's pretty exciting, lots of fun. Um, also, remember we have, which someone laughingly called the Heritage Mugs. Yeah, we ordered them four years ago, just before the pandemic. And so we've changed our names. So if you fondly remember, Vic, take a mug and pray. Every time you have your cup of coffee or tea in there, pray for God's people. At IES Fondon. All right. So you're welcome to take them there to that. All right, we have four readers because we have two long stories today. The first one from the Old Testament is maybe not what you would expect on a Sunday when we're talking about baptism. But it is about obedience. And that's the bigger theme for today as we talk about the unpredictable kingdom of God. Alrighty, so our Old Testament readers, come on up. And as soon as they're done, hand your mics off to the New Testament readers, alright? Who's the Old Testament readers? Reading from the Old Testament, Second Kings, chapter five. Naaman was army commander of the king of Aram. He was very important to his master and was highly respected. That's because the Lord had helped him win the battle over Aram's enemies. He was a brave soldier. But he had a skin disease. Groups of soldiers from Aram had marched out. They had captured a young girl from Israel. She became a servant of Naaman's wife. The young girl spoke to the woman she was serving. She said, I wish my master would go and see the prophet who is in Samaria. He would heal my master of his skin disease. Naaman went to see his own master. He told him what the girl from Israel had said. I think you should go, the king of Aram replied. I'll give you a letter to take to the king of Israel. So Naaman left. He took 750 pounds of silver with him. He also took 150 pounds of gold, and he took 10 sets of clothes. He carried the letter to the king of Israel. It said, I'm sending my servant Naaman to you with this letter. I want you to heal him of his skin disease. The king of Israel read the letter. As soon as he did, he tore his royal robes. He said, Am I God? Can I kill people and bring them back to life? Why does this fellow send someone to me to be healed of his skin disease? He must be trying to pick a fight with me. Elijah, the man of God, heard when the king of Israel had torn his robes. So he sent to the king a message. Elijah said, Why have you torn your robes? Tell the man to come to me. Then he will know that there is a prophet in Israel. So Naaman went to see Elisha. He took his horses and chariots with him. He stopped at the door of Elisha's house. Elisha sent a messenger out to him. The messenger said, Go, wash yourself in the Jordan River seven times. Then your skin will be healed. You will be pure and clean again. But Naaman went away angry. He said, I was sure Elisha would come out to me. I thought he would stand there and pray to the Lord his God. I thought he would wave his hand over my skin, then I will be healed. And what about the Ivana and Farpar rivers of Damascus? Aren't they better than all the rivers of Israel? Couldn't I wash in the rivers of Damascus and be made pure and clean? So he turned and went away. He was very angry. Naaman's servants went over to him. They 
said, You are like a father to us. What if Elisha the prophet had told you to do some great thing? Wouldn't you have done it? But he only said, Wash yourself, then you will be pure and clean. You should be even more willing to do that. So Naaman went down to the Jordan River. He dipped himself in it seven times. He did exactly what the man of God had told him to do. Then his skin was made pure again. It became clean like the skin of a young boy. Naaman and all his attendants went back to the man of God. Naaman stood in front of Elisha. Naaman said, Now I know that there is no God anywhere in the world except in Israel. So please accept the gift from me. The prophet answered, I serve the Lord. You can be sure that he lives. And you can be just as sure that I won't accept a gift from you. Even though Naaman begged him to take it, Elisha wouldn't. I can see that you won't accept a gift from me, said Naaman. But please, let me have some soil from your land. Give me as much as a pair of mules can carry. Here's why I want it. I won't ever bring burnt offerings and sacrifices to any other god again. I'll bring them only to the Lord. I'll worship him on his own soil. But there is one thing I hope the Lord will forgive me for. From time to time, my master will enter the temple to bow down to his god, Rhyman. When he does, he'll leave on my arm. Then I'll have to bow down there also. I hope the Lord will forgive me for that. Go in peace, Elisha said. Naaman started out on his way. Gehazi was the servant of Elijah, the man of God. Gehazi said to himself, My master was too easy on Naaman from Aram. He should have accepted the gift Naaman brought. I'm going to run after him. I'm going to get something from him. And that's just as sure as the Lord is alive. Gehazi hurried after Naaman. Naaman saw him running toward him. So he got down from the chariot to greet him. Is everything all right? He asked. Everything is all right, Gehazi answered. My master sent me to say, two young men from the group of the prophets have just come to me. They've come from the hill country of Ephraim. Please give them 75 pounds of silver and two sets of clothes. I wish you would take, twi twi take twice as much silver said Naaman. He begged Gehazi to accept it. The Naaman tied up 150 pounds of silver in two bags. He also gave Gehazi two sets of clothes. He gave all of it to two of his own servants. They carried it ahead of Gehazi. Gehazi came to the hill where Elisha lived. Then the servants handed the things over to Gehazi. He put them away in Elisha's house. He sent the men away and they left. Then he ran back inside the house. He stood in front of his master, Elisha. Gehazi, where have you been? Elisha asked. I didn't go anywhere, Gehazi answered. But Elisha said to him, Didn't my spirit go with you? I know that the man got down from his chariot to greet you. Is this the time for you to accept money or clothes? Is it the time to take olive groves, vineyards, flocks, or herbs? Is it the time to accept male and female slaves? You and your children after you will have male and skin disease forever. Then Gehazi left Elisha, and he had male and skin disease. His skin had become as white as snow. This is the word of the Lord. Okay, New Testament readers.
from Matthew 3. In those days, John the Baptist came and preached in the desert of Judea. He said, Turn away from your sins. The kingdom of heaven has come near. John is the one who Messiah the prophet has spoken about. He has said, The messenger is going out in the desert. Prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight paths for him. John's clothes were made out of camel's hair. He had a leather belt around his waist. His food was locust and wild honey. People went out to him from Jerusalem and all Judea. They also came from the whole area around the Jordan River. When they confessed their sins, John baptized them in the Jordan. John saw many princes and citizens coming to where he was baptizing. He said to them, You are like a nest of poisonous snakes. Who warned you to escape the coming of God's anger? If in a way that shows you have turned away from your sins, don't think you can say to yourself, Abraham is our father. I tell you, God can raise up children from for Abraham even from these stones. The axe is ready to cut the roots of the trees. All the trees that don't produce good fruit will be cut down. They will be thrown into the fire. I will baptize you with water, calling you to turn away from your sins. But after me, someone is coming who is more powerful than I am. I am not worthy to carry his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His pitchfork is in his hand to clear the snow from his dressing floor. He will gather his weight into the storeroom, but he will burn up the husk with fire that can be put out. Jesus came, Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan River. He wanted to be baptized by John, but John tried to stop him. So he told Jesus, so he told Jesus, I need to baptize by you, so why do you come to me? Jesus replied, let it be the way from for now. It is the right for us to, to do this. It carries out God's holy plan. Then John agreed. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he came, he came up out of the water. At the moment heaven was opened, Jesus saw the Spirit of God coming down on him like a dove. A voice from heaven said, This is my son, and I love him. I am very blessed with him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks to be God. Well, today we continue talking about the unpredictable kingdom of God. We're Walmart Rosemary Kowalski and we're on the ministry team here. And you know, sometimes Walmart and I, and maybe you two, are reluctant to do what God asks of us. Do you ever feel so impressed like you should do something, but you go like, uh, I don't know. Maybe, maybe not feel like it, whatever, right? Or that's hard, or I'll stick out, or I'm too shy, or I'm too thick. We have lots of excuses. In the Old Testament reading, an enemy king sends his chief warrior to Israel for healing. The king of Israel at the time is shocked. Is his enemy trying to provoke a war? Luckily, the prophet Elisha hears about it and says, hey, send him to me. The warrior comes to the prophet. He expects a big, big presentation, you know, wands, waving of hands, that kind of a thing. He's after all an important man, but instead the prophet sends his servant out and just gives this important man a simple task to obey. Bathe seven times in the Jordan River. Well, scripture says that didn't go over very well. Naaman went away angry and said, I thought he would surely come up to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God, wave his hands over the spot and cure me of my leprosy. Let's move over a bit to get rid of some of that echo. 
Are not the rivers of Damascus better than all the waters of Israel? Like, I like my own stuff better. Why should I go there? Right? He's not happy about this. So he turned and he went off in a rage. So, he had his own idea about how God should work. Yeah? But his servants persuade him to try simple obedience. He is cured. How unexpected is that? All right, on the other hand, Elisha's servant. Remember, we have two prophets at this time. We have Elijah. And, and this is the one that he mentored, Elisha. Okay, so this is the second one. I always right? remember them because J becomes comes before S. Elijah <laughs> and Elisha. Okay, that's how I remember. That's why he got A's on his exams. <laughs> one of the reasons. <laughs> okay, Elisha's servant is underhanded. He's seen many miracles, but he's greedy. He wants to profit, and he invents a scheme to make money off of God's miracles. And the consequence is what? He gets the leprosy or the skin disease, not only for himself, but for his children. No, God has just cured Naaman for his obedience. And now, all of Gehazi's family, there will always be someone with leprosy. Oh, that's terrible. By the way, um, uh, what was it, 150 pounds of gold? That works out to about 70 kilos. So what? 750 pounds of silver, that's about 350 kilos. It's a chunk. Well, the kingdom of God is unpredictable. Is everybody who dumps themselves in a river healed? No. What about everyone who distorts God's message for personal gain? Do they get an incurable skin disease? <laughs> we might think that's a good idea. <laughs> but if it's not us. Yeah. Yeah, as long as it's not us, yeah. Uh, so let's make sure we don't do that. <laughs> Anyway, God deals in his own way with each of us. The key is not that we're called for what we get out of the kingdom of God or what we expect, but whether we will obey God and learn to love God, even when we don't understand his ways, will we trust him? In the New Testament reading, we meet a strange man who is called to obey God. This guy is named John the Baptist. Number one, he's an unexpected, or maybe we even say weird, messenger. He's weird looking. What is his diet? Locusts and wild honey. He lives in the wilderness. I bet his parents were mortified. Isn't that every parent's dream? To have your kid go off into the wilderness, wear sackcloth and or wild goat skins and camel hair. Oh, that's even worse. Camels are really <laughs> stinky and yes. anyway. Uh, his dad is a priest, you know, so you would want him to be pretty respectable. No, this kid is odd. Now, he happens to be related to Jesus. Their moms, John's and Jesus' mothers, were um, John's mother and Jesus' mother, to be explicit, um, were devout worshippers. They had spent time together when they were pregnant. All right, so that's who John is. But the second thing is that he has a strong message. Repent and be baptized. People come to hear him because he's unusual. He's demanding. He says, repent. Someone amazing is coming after me who will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Get ready for the kingdom of God. He doesn't say, if you feel like it. He says, this is what you need to do to get ready. Yeah. As you can imagine, John is pretty unpopular with the authorities because he's not at all shy. And he tells them, you guys need to repent or God will judge you. And that doesn't go over well because they they were already perfect. They are the guy 
guides for the blind. They are the instructors of the foolish. They are the ones that everybody needs to listen to. They thought they understood the kingdom of God, and John says, uh-uh. John also gives clear instructions. Repent and be baptized. Change your way of life. And then Jesus comes along. And John is surprised by Jesus' request. Jesus wants to be baptized as well. And John answers Jesus, I need to be baptized by you. And do you come to me? Look, Jesus did not need to repent. He was starting with a clean slate. He was already doing what was right. But he also, as part of his doing what is right, gives us a model of obedience. And how does God respond? We hear a voice from heaven that says, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. And then, Jesus goes and tells us, what I've done, you do too. You follow my example, tell good news, baptize others. Those others include you and me, so many centuries later. But why do we get baptized? It's a matter of obedience. Not an option for whenever I feel like it. Or it's not even an option to say no because I don't feel like it. Or maybe I'm hungry. Maybe I'm shy. Jesus never says, now, now this is important to understand. He doesn't say, when you feel good, when you feel ready, when you think it might be a good idea, when a bunch of your friends get baptized too, when you're no longer feeling shy or afraid, when you are a good enough Christian, when you are holy enough, he doesn't say that. He just says, believe, repent, and be baptized. Ah, if you're waiting to be good enough or mature enough to be baptized, stop waiting. Just obey the command of Jesus. Otherwise, it's a little bit like expecting a baby or a young child to have to pass a university exam to belong to a family. Just, you know, Waldemar was a professor at university, and we had babies. But we didn't say, hey, if you want to be part of the Kowalski family, you have to wait until you pass his classroom examinations. <laughs> Actually, that came later. <laughs> they were born. Their names were listed on a birth certificate with our names as their parents. We fed them, changed their diapers, clothed them, gave them a place to sleep, let them grow up normally and develop. Something like what Jesus does with us. We took them to visit relatives. They stayed with grandma and grandpa. And we have family rules. This is how you behave in this family. <laughs> something like what Jesus does. And they learned to obey, but it was step by step. Just as we obey Jesus by repenting and being baptized, you don't have to be a mature believer to be accepted by God. But you do have to agree to what he asks of his family and his family values. You have to obey your heavenly father. When you come into God's family, you believe, you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and you demonstrate that you made that decision by being baptized. Now, we're an international church, and so we've got people from a lot of different backgrounds here. Different parts of the church practice baptism in different ways, and, and that's cool, in different groups. Um, some groups practice uh, infant dedication or infant baptism where the baby is blessed and sprinkled with water. Other groups with adults, they sprinkle them uh, if they have decided to follow Jesus. Here at IES, 
um, and this is part of our tradition, uh, we immerse a believer in water because of the symbolism of burial and resurrection. Jesus doesn't say, make sure the tank is full, make sure it's warm, make sure it's this. He says, repent and be baptized. All right, the instruction is baptism. In Romans 6, Paul writes to the church, all of us were baptized into Christ Jesus. Don't you know that we were baptized into his death? By being baptized, we were buried with Christ into his death. Christ has been raised from the dead by the Father's glory. And like Christ, we also can live a new life. By being baptized, he goes on to say, we have been joined with him in a death like his, so we will certainly also be joined with him in his resurrection. So here at IES, when, it, when we baptize you, we say these words, buried with Christ as you go down into the water, and we don't keep you there, because our goal <laughs> isn't to send you to heaven right now, <laughs> okay? Uh, it would be so much easier. <laughs> I don't think anybody would come to church. <laughs> Don't get we, say, baptized <laughs> we say buried with Christ as you go down in the water and then raised to new life as you come up. Because baptism is a reenactment. It's a picture of the death and the resurrection of Jesus. This is what Jesus experienced for you and we witness it's a picture of how our life has been changed. We have died to sin. We've been raised to new life. And baptism is commanded by Jesus when he sends his disciples into the world. These are his instructions. After the resurrection, the 11 disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. So they're already obeyed. All right? When they saw him, they worshipped him. But some doubted. Then Jesus came to him and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. The Gospel writers agree with each other. This isn't just in one. Mark records it this way. He said to them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. And we'll have time for takeaways and questions later on. So if you've got questions about some of this, that'll be a good time to ask those. Jesus said, If you believe, you will be baptized. I want to challenge you. Is that you? Have you obeyed him? Jesus doesn't make this an option. So we feel that baptism means at least two things, and, and we could probably make a longer list than this. But first of all, when we're baptized, we agree with God that Jesus alone brings salvation. Salvation is only found in Jesus Christ. Now, if you belong to him, you will follow him. And that means this act of obedience, you are becoming a part of the heritage of faith in Christ Jesus. You're a part of this unpredictable kingdom of God. Yeah, and you're going to serve in that unpredictable kingdom. So baptism was expected in the early church. When you became a follower of Jesus, you got baptized. Think about the Ethiopian in a chariot, okay? If you don't know that story, it's in the book of Acts. He discusses the Messiah with the disciple Philip. Or think of the new converts who have just heard the good news, like the crowd at Pentecost in Jerusalem. Think about this. And we'll pop up the slide for you so you can see what Peter says to them. But it was just like natural you, you get baptized. And in fact, we're told 3,000 people were baptized that day. I'd like to have seen that. 
one of the coolest things Rosemary I experienced for sure was uh, we were in China, what, 12 years ago, something like that, 10, 12 years ago, and we're at, in a Sunday morning service where 113 people were baptized. That was incredible. Can you imagine what it would be like to watch 3,000 people say, I'm going to do this. We'll, we'll talk about that in just a moment. Look, if you were a part of the early church like the Corinthians or the Galatians who heard from Paul, um, uh, pop up the next slide if you would. Or you were a part of the church that got letters from Peter. Peter gives similar instructions. Um, yes, in some churches they have a waiting period. And I used to teach church history, and so I know that within a hundred years or so, after the time of Christ, 150 years, there was a waiting period where you had to go through a long set of instructions, and the people would watch you to make sure you were living right and stuff like that. But the early church doesn't wait. If you said, I'm going to do this, you were baptized. There wasn't a waiting period. You didn't have to pass the university exams before you could join the family. So the Ethiopian sees a pool and says, is there any reason why I can't be baptized? He's on his way back to his country. Obviously, Philip has told him, when you believe, you will be baptized. And the Ethiopian responds, all right, I believe. Is there any reason why you can't do that right now? And Philip says, hey, let's go. And we don't know if they ever saw each other again. There wasn't a long process or long catechism. It was a confirmation that God had brought this man's salvation through Jesus Christ. You believe? He got baptized. Here's another thing baptism does. It's an agreement which is witnessed by others. It's where I say, I'm going to step over this line. I'm now on the other side of the line. That was me before. This is me now. Uh, in some countries, the act of baptism is what officially identifies you as a follower of Jesus Christ. And I think it's important that we have people who witness the event. This is something you're saying in front of friends, of family, of of people who matter. And you know what? It's really important because when you come to a place in your life, and I'm sorry to have to tell you this, but you probably will at some time in your Christian life come to a time of doubt or of crisis. You may feel that God is silent. You can remind yourself that you made this statement that was witnessed by everybody there and by God. You made a promise before God that you will follow him. Others can remind us that God will honor his promise. And Rosemary has a wonderful story. I think you guys have heard this one before, but if you're new here, our son was baptized when he was eight or nine. I can't remember. Because his older brother and sister were getting baptized. Waldemar's dad was a pastor. He was going to baptize them. And Timothy said, I want to be baptized. And we were like, no, you're too young. You wait and be sure. And he preached us a sermon. I believe in Jesus. I, I know this. I will follow him all my life. He preached us a good baptism sermon. You know, you wish you'd record those moments and we wouldn't have to get up here. We just have to preach to you. Well, anyway, so we said, fine. You know the commitment you're making, get baptized. And Opa baptized all three kids. All right, come to Timothy being 15, and he's in a Christian school, and his heart is fighting. He doesn't like what he sees. He says, Mom, I don't want to be Christian. I'm off driving to, to lead a Bible study and to mentor Bible study leaders. And I'm thinking, God, I'm not losing my kid. I don't care about anybody else. If I lose my kid, nothing is worth it. So he says, well, I'm not going to be a Christian. I say, well, what's that about? And he says, huh, well, all those hypocrites, you know, they're raising their hands in chapel and going, praise God, and then they're cursing and fighting and stealing and lying, going back across the parking lot to class, 
And the teachers go like, oh, isn't that a good kid? <laughs> he was so fed up. Well, you know what? My uncle walked away from faith for that reason. He became a believer on his deathbed. My brother brought him to the Lord. My brother, in the same place in the family, that third kid, struggled with faith. And here's the third one in our family. And I'm like, Jesus, we're not letting this kid go. So he says, well, I'm not going to become And he slams the door and walks out to school. And I'm thinking, dear Jesus, what just happened? So I said, you know, I went and taught. And I, I thought about it a little bit, but I just let it go. I thought, God, I said, you know, I don't know what to do with this. Because this kid is really, he's fighting with me all the time. Now he's fighting with you. So a couple days later, I'm driving him to school again. And he says, well, did you think about what I said? And I thought, well, he said a lot of things since then. No, I don't know even know what you're talking about. So I said, well, what are you talking about here? And he said, well, I told you I don't want to be a Christian. And I go, oh, that. <laughs> and the Lord put in my heart... And you, you probably can tell, I don't react really earnest. I'm good in an emergency because I want to get things fixed before I explode two or three days later. Right? So anyway, I'm thinking, God, this is the time. I need something for my son. And you know what God brought to mind? Baptism. And I said, do you remember when you were a little kid? He says, so? I said, you talked dad and me into letting you get baptized. You preached us a sermon that your whole life you would follow God. I said, you preached a better sermon than Opa. <laughs> now we let you go. And you went down, came up. So your fight isn't with me or with your school. Your fight is with Jesus. You have to talk to Jesus about this. If you're walking away... That's who you're going to talk to. And you know what? That never came up again. <laughs> he did slam the door. <laughs> <laughs> that day, many days after. But you know, and by the way, this child became a pastor. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so, so the story doesn't end with rebellion, but you know sometimes that baptism will be your anchor. If you have been baptized, I want to tell you, something happens. You tie your soul into the kingdom of God by declaring, I belong to Jesus. So those of you who have been baptized already, I want to invite you to think back to that day. When it happened, <laughs> and Rosemary and I showed you a picture a few weeks back of our I didn't show it, you showed it. I showed it. It's embarrassing. <laughs> And a little shrimp, you know, compared to side of this one, um, who's already a beautiful young lady. Stop. <laughs> <laughs> but if you think back to that day, what did it mean to you on the day it happened? What was going through your mind? Do you understand it better today? I'm going to give you just a few seconds to think about that and to reflect. Everybody who's been baptized on what that meant for you. Waldemar and I were children. We were 11 and 12 years old when we were baptized. Did we understand everything Jesus had done for us at that point? No way. We don't even understand it now. But I remember coming out of the water and thinking, Jesus, my whole life, I am yours. Just remember that. Just that. That. And I walked into the room. We we had gowns on, you know, like in the traditional churches. Your mom sewed you a nice, like it was almost like a bride, a nice dress, and you went in, right? And it swelled up in the water, and you were like people like this. I remember that whole thing. But I remember coming up out of the water, going to change, and just weeping, thinking, I am yours. Obeyed you in this. It meant so much to me. I never forgot that dedication, even when I kind of doubted that God cared anything at all about it. 
you know, we've told you, we told our story uh, earlier this year in, in January of how we ended up here. And Rosary and I were called to the, a life of serving others when we were 10 and 11 years old. We were in a very, very traditional German church. Um, kids were not allowed to partake of communion. Until we were 16. Well, until you had been baptized. When you were baptized, then you could um, become a member of the church, and that was when you were 16. And so it was my great uncle who was the pastor, and we, similar to what we, our son did at age 8, we preached him a sermon on why... Not we, you. <laughs> I preached him a sermon. This is why I must be baptized, because God has called me into his service. I am dedicating my life to God, and there is no way I'm going to wait. And, you know, we, we were baptized at age 11 and 12, and we, we became junior members of the church. We weren't allowed to go to church business meeting and vote or do any of that kind of stuff. But we actually could already then take communion. And that was interesting because this was a traditional German church where you pass the cup down the aisle and everybody takes a sip. Anyway, okay. <laughs> yeah. So we knew Jesus had said, if you follow me, get baptized. And so we did. We were young. We already understood it. In the Christian church, in, in this segment of those who follow Christ, we have two things we call ordinances. In the Catholic church, they have seven sacraments, of which you can do six, because you can't be ordained and be married, so you can choose six of the seven. But in the Christian church, there are two things that we believe that God, Jesus commanded or ordained. And they are baptism and communion. Good job. So we here at IES Bandone, we celebrate communion every Sunday. We're going to do it again today. And we baptize people who have become disciples of Jesus. Followers who've been brought from death to life by his death and resurrection. We're going to have a sign-up sheet outside. So if you want to know more about baptism, you can write your name and your WhatsApp or your email, your best contact in that column. I want to know more. If you're ready to be baptized, we're going to have a baptism service before Easter this year. Write your name in that column, would you? I want to be baptized. Serving Jesus is a matter of love, not duty and guilt. I don't want to create feelings of guilt or whatever. But, here comes the but. <laughs> Jesus did say, do this, obey me. For those of us who serve him in the capacity that Rosemary and I do, we, everybody who is follower of Jesus is supposed to go into the world, make disciples, baptize them, teach them about Christ. And so, if you haven't followed Jesus yet in the waters of baptism, we invite you to do that. Obey your master, your Lord. This is God's kingdom, and your king has said, this is what you do if you're a part of this. So will you obey the king of this unpredictable kingdom? We want to invite you to think about those of you who have been baptized. What did you promise God? It wasn't to be perfect. It wasn't to never sin again. You promised to follow you followed into the waters of baptism. You came up and you said, I belong to you. I'm yours. So if you've already made that decision, think about that this week. And remember, this week we're reading Matthew 3 and Matthew 4. 4 will be next week and Joshua will be teaching that. But before we go any further, do you have some takeaways or questions about baptism? So yeah, thank you. Um, I have two questions actually. The first one, 
Um, do you think there's a need for a second baptism? I mean, um, because sometimes when you, uh, like once you're baptized, you made a promise to God, but you know, along the way, then you drifted away, then um, you decided to come back to the church. So that's my first question. And the second question regarding the baptism, what's your stance on the uh, baptism by the Holy Spirit? Thank you. Okay. Um, we do have an example in Acts chapter 19 where Paul and some others encounter disciples in Ephesus who had already been baptized, but they were not aware of the baptism of Jesus. Now, they're already disciples. They're already followers of Jesus. And Paul tells them, hey, uh, the baptism of John was for repentance. And at that point in time, it's interesting that you gave those two questions because they're connected. At that point in time, they are baptized in the name of Jesus, and they start speaking in tongues. And they're filled with the Holy Spirit. We're told that quite explicitly. So, first of all, what happens if, for instance, you became a follower of Jesus, you were baptized, you fell away, uh, and again, within the Christian church, there are differing opinions on that, can you fall away or not. But, but anyway, you, you slacked off on your promise. Should you then be rebaptized? My personal feeling is probably not. It's if your first baptism was one where you didn't fully understand what it was you were doing. Okay? Uh, we, we have people who are baptized as children and infants. Rosemary and I will not tell them you have to be rebaptized. But if they come to us and say, I am now making a conscious decision, we'll say, on that conscious decision on your desire to witness. We, uh, we would consider that to be analogous or similar to the situation in um, Acts chapter 19. One interesting thing, oops, one interesting thing that happens is um, if you go to Israel, everybody piles down to the Jordan River and gets rebaptized. I even forgot to bring my bathing suit. I was like, we're gonna do what? I remember my baptism, I don't need a rebaptism. But you know, that was such a meaningful experience. Absolutely. Yeah. And so, did we look at that when we were, I, I watched that and I thought, you know what, they are really redevoting themselves to God at the place where maybe Jesus was baptized. Right? And so, do we condemn them for that? Or if, if you say, I'm making this decision, want to be baptized, well, more and I will turn you away. But is it necessary? We don't think it's necessary. Is it sinful? No. Regarding the baptism of the Holy Spirit, um, and again, we come from many traditions. Rosemary and I come from a Pentecostal background. And so, you know, our understanding on this will be different from that of people who've come from what's called a cessationist background. In other words, uh, with the last of the apostles, it was no longer necessary for God to give the gifts of the Spirit to the church. So things like prophecy and speaking in tongues and interpretation of tongues and so on. Uh, I would personally say my understanding is uh, that the people gathered on the day of Pentecost we're already followers of Jesus. But something else happened. In Acts 19, the disciples who were there were already following Jesus, but something else happened. Now, if you just, this is not the entry exam to heaven. Okay? Let me just make that really clear. If your understanding is different on this, God is not going to ask you at the pearly gates or St. Peter or whoever's there, Hey, what do you think about speaking in tongues and about baptism of the Holy Spirit and so on? That is not the entrance exam. For me, this is something that I cherish. I wouldn't give it up. For others, it's something they don't want. And, you know, we can have a discussion on that. Have it later. It's yeah. a long discussion. Yeah, it's a, it's a long <laughs> discussion. And you know what? I'm, what I'm going to tell you is this. Read the Bible. 
read God's Word, and ask the Holy Spirit to reveal what the Holy Spirit wants you to do. Um, in Bible scholarship circles, there are these approaches of what's called reader response or authorial intent. In other words, do we read the Bible in terms of what I read in it, or should we read it in terms of what God wants to say? And I hope we read it in terms of, I'm looking for God's message to me. And if I read it honestly, you may come to a different conclusion than I do. That's okay. Because why do we do takeaways? Because we believe the Holy Spirit is in everybody who follows Jesus Christ. So the Holy Spirit is not resident right up here. Oh, I hope he is. Well, <laughs> only, only up there. I sure hope the Holy Spirit is, is up here. But not only up here, the Holy Spirit will also speak to you as you read God's Word. And, you know, we have differences of opinion in the Bible between, for instance, Paul and Barnabas, so sharp that they split their uh, ministries apart. And you might say, wow, that's a real disaster. No, now there were two people going out and sharing the gospel. Is that a disaster? No, it's not. We would probably say, ask God for every gift he will give you, every empowerment he has for you, and never say to God, you must, no. and never say to God, you may not. That's... Walk of obedience. That's, Never say to God you must or you may not. Either one of those is dangerous. Just hold your hands out and ask God every gift, every empowerment that he wants to give to you. And I think we should lay that question at that. Okay. If you want to have a deep theological discussion about that, there he is. Any other, uh, sorry, that was a long extended response, but any other uh, takeaways, questions, Because if what we say doesn't agree with God's word, we're wrong, 
God's word is right. And if you love us, you're going to call us on that. You're going to say, hey, I'm reading this, and it's different from what you said. If you hate me, you'll let me go to disaster. If you love me, you're going to correct me when I'm wrong. We're going to do our best not to lead you in false directions. Okay? It's a promise we make because we want to be good shepherds. But ultimately, you must read God's word for yourself and see what it says. All right, and you know what it says about baptism. So, do we have one more takeaway before we go to communion? Oh, right back here. This this baptize reminds me of uh, that in that time the uh, John the Baptist, there's only one person that doesn't need baptize. <laughs> this this is a uh, this is a verse in Matthew three chapter six. When you read that, just imagine what Jesus said when he got baptized. Because everybody confesses their sin. Jesus only who does not have sin. And he not say anything. But the confirmation is one line from the heaven. This is my beloved son. It's my devil. Amen. And you know, there's an echo to that in an event that John records. I think it's John chapter 8. Um, the woman caught in adultery, where Jesus says, if you're without sin, throw the first rock. How many people there were without sin? The only one was the one who says, I'm not throwing rocks. And then he says to the woman, neither do I condemn you, go and sin no more. He doesn't say, go ahead and keep on doing what you're doing, no. But he does not condemn her, and what a wonderful Savior we have. I'd love to talk more about that right now, but we don't have time. Let's stand to our feet and pray, and then um, before we sit down, we'll have Alice pray if you bring the elements if you don't have them, but let's just pray together. Uh, Lord, there's so many times when we say we will obey, and it's just difficult. Like Naaman, maybe we think, Oh, this is too ordinary. This isn't the way I thought of it. This isn't what I want to do. And yet, you keep calling us to obedience. And Lord, those of us who have been baptized remember that obedience. We remember that we said we will follow and we will obey. So Lord, we just pray that you would forgive us where we forget, where we neglect our promise. Your blood is so strong. Your body was broken for us to heal everything that is broken in us. And so today, as we reach our hands out, we just say, God, here you are and here we are. Give us hearts that love you so much that we trust you and obey you, even when we don't know what lies ahead and even when we don't know what you're doing. We trust you and we love you. And Lord, for those of us who are considering obedience, we pray for the courage to obey you with all our hearts. We pray that we could follow you into the waters of baptism and say, we're yours. Do with us as we please you. Because we know you're our Heavenly Father and you keep us, we trust you. Lord, if there's anyone here who hasn't made that commitment, who hasn't accepted you, we ask for that. We just ask that our hands be open to be healed and forgiven through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, the King of this unpredictable kingdom of God. So we come to you in the name of Jesus. We come to you because you are the one who knows the future knows the past and loves us in the present. In Jesus' name we come and thanks be. Amen. You may be seated. If you don't have the elements, would you put your hands up?
you'd like to partake if you made that decision to follow Jesus? The second celebration of church is communion, the eating together to remember what Jesus has done. We eat the bread to remember his broken body. We drink together to remember the blood that was spilled when Jesus became a sacrifice for your sins and mine. And again, we're a community of lots of backgrounds. Some churches practice closed communion. You're going to only partake if the priest knows you personally, etc., etc. At IES, we practice open communion. If you are a follower of Jesus, if you've admitted you cannot save yourself, you believe that Jesus died for you and you have committed to following him, you're welcome to join us this morning. So we're going to celebrate communion together. Paul tells us, for I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's eat together his, his body, body broken, broken for us. We do this in obedience, not even understanding a fraction of what you've accomplished. I'm so grateful. Thank you for that broken body. Lord, if there's someone here who needs healing in their mind, in their emotions, in their relationships, in their body, apply that broken body to us this morning, God. Heal us through that broken body. In the same way after supper, Jesus took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me, for whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's partake together. His blood shed for us. Thank you for forgiveness. Thank you for restoration to the Father, to you, through the Spirit, to each other. Thank you for my brothers, my sisters, for your body here, gathered, celebrating what you have done. Thank you for what you have done. Receive this as your benediction. Let's stand with us. Go forth into the world to live as those baptized into Christ's mission. And may the eternal light of God keep you rock solidly immersed in the river of life, in the peace and the power of the Holy Spirit now and forevermore. We, we go, go in peace to love and serve the Lord in the name of Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. God be with you. Enjoy the uh, community.